Thanks a lot for being here. I'm Bruce Clark. I'm the interim chair of the Department of English. We're really pleased to be hosting this event tonight. I see we've got a broad interdisciplinary audience that's come out to hear Dr. Frederick Turner talk tonight about the relationship between literature and commerce. And so, welcome to our beautiful auditorium here in our Palace of Knowledge. We're very happy to have Dr. Turner visit our campus and come to our department. And so, right now, I'll ask Dr. Balch to introduce Frederick Turner. Thank you, Bruno. In, in, in reading things that uh, Frederick Turner has written, at least some of them, much less than I think I should and uh, much less than I eventually will, uh, it occurs to me that, that, that Dr. Turner is a kind of natural philosopher in a, in a modernized sense of that term, 18th century equivalent of that term would have been scientist. Uh, he's a natural philosopher in the sense that looking at nature through science, he thinks about what then one can say about the human condition, uh, more than the human condition, the human prospect, more than the human prospect, uh, the prospect of, of life, uh, the universe, and, and everything, as I recall. I, uh, title of something somewhere way back. Uh, that's a very unusual thing for an academic to be doing in this day and age, uh, thinking about questions of that breath and writing about them. And even more unusual, or maybe not so unusual, uh, the contemplation of the situation of life, the universe, and everything uh, is accompanied by a poetic quest to kind of capture that uh, in works of art of his own. Um, there's something very magisterial about that, something that's kind of quite breathtaking uh, in, in an academy that is often, and for good reason, kind of compartmentalized uh, and very special in its focus. We need the kind of balance, sorely need the kind of balance that Dr. Turner provides. Um, kind of basic biographical uh, information. Uh, Dr. Turner uh, is Victor and Edith. Excuse me, those are, those are his parents. I'm trying to find the title. He is Founders Professor of Arts and Humanities at the University of Texas in, at Dallas. Uh, he has taught at a number of other institutions. He's uh, British by birth and, and, and British by basic education. Uh, as a B-lit from Oxford. Um, but there are a lot of people who have those kinds of credentials, uh, and very few of them who have chosen to take the course that Dr. Turner has pursued. One of the signatures uh, for the Institute for the Study of Western Civilization is to bring back to the forefront of academic attention a consideration of big things that require synthetic thinking on a very ambitious scale, and if possible with poetry too, all the better. So uh, we have a man here who certainly squarely fits that bill, a uh, very exceptional man, and let me now turn the floor over to Dr. Turner. Thank you for the lovely introduction, Steve. And Steve is a synthetic uh, thinker himself, so that's very high praise coming from him. Um, the title of this talk is The Price of Everything, the Value of Nothing. And I'm sure everybody got the reference. It was uh, Oscar Wilde in uh, Dorian Gray, a uh, picture of Dorian Gray. Um, uh, these days, people know the price of everything, but the value of nothing. Um, now, uh, the, in a way, I, I want to talk about price and value. 
I want to talk about uh, um, uh, how literature um, deals with the aesthetic and moral demands and veridical demands of, of, of the craft um, while uh, also dealing with a, a, a market economy. Certainly the money view of things doesn't satisfy our spiritual needs, at least not as presently understood. When the cash and credit economy of the human community loses contact with the traditional barter and gift exchange system, something profoundly valuable can get lost. Perhaps all of our violent and brutal attempts to replace economic rationality with more or less bloody religious, ethnic, nationalistic, or ideological conquest are attempts to recover that lost sense of community and spiritual dignity. Ezra Pound certainly thought so. It's become clear that we shall be living with the free market for, for, for the foreseeable future. Of course, free is always in quotation marks. Um, but uh, it, it, uh, there's what you might call a sufficiently free market, let's say. Um, what we need, perhaps, is a, is a human economics, a kind of market that fully supports the moral, spiritual, and aesthetic relationships among persons and things. It's clear that we should revise our earlier mechanistic notion of economics. Must we find a new language for it? The answer, surprisingly, is no. And this is really where I begin with Shakespeare. And what I regard as the sanest and most helpful view of money and its relation to literature, the arts, ethics, and human flourishing in general. In plays like The Merchant of Venice, Henry IV, Parts I and II, King Lear and The Winter's Tale, and several others, and in the sonnets, Shakespeare shows us that buried within our existing language of finance and business are the living meanings that we seek, such words as bond, trust, Goods, good, save, equity, value, mean, means, meaning, all of those words. Redeem, redemption, forgive, dear is a nice word. Obligation, duty, interest, debt, honor, company. Balance, credit, worth, due, duty, thrift, use, 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 usury, will, very important word, partner, deed, fair, oh, ought, our fundamental obligation word, ought, is of course, the, uh, uh, the, the, it's something like a sort of past participle of the word owe, to owe something. Um, treasure, sacrifice, risk, royalty, fortune, venture, and grace. Talk about the grace period and so on. They preserve within them the values, patterns of action, qualities, abstract entities, and social emotions that characterize the gift and barter exchange systems upon which they're founded. Indeed, these words, whose meanings are inseparable from their economic content, make up a large fraction of our most fundamental ethical vocabulary. The core questions of economics are what value is and how it's created. These are mysterious questions not accessible to the mathematical models uh, me methods of the academic discipline of economics, which deals admirably with how utility, the technical term for value, is exchanged, stored, communicated, regulated, and gauged, but which remains prudently silent on the nature and origin of utility itself. Literally, utility is usefulness, but useful for what? 
Perhaps poets and storytellers can tell us more than econ economists can about what value is in itself. Um, little um, Republican spokesman moment here. <laughs> Not that I'm a Republican spokesman. <laughs> poets must be always exploring the subtle chemistry of the meanings of words and the old and new ways in which human beings come to desire and cherish that meaning. Poets spend their, spend their lives making value out of combinations of words that have no economic worth in themselves, being common property, infinitely reproducible, and devoid of rarity value. William Shakespeare, for instance, became one of the richest commoners in England, a media tycoon of his day, essentially by combining words in such a way as to persuade people to pay good money for them. Where poets blaze the trail, economists and business people can follow, usually without knowing who made the path in the first place. Uh, advertising, you might say, is sort of second order poetry. Shakespeare was a key figure in creating that Renaissance system of meanings, values, and implicit rules, which eventually gave rise to the modern world market and which still underpin it. Shakespeare made us conceive an economy as like a, a theater company, a troupe of actors whose interactions generate the plot of the play. He taught us practically how life with others is not necessarily a zero-sum game, but an arena where all make profit and competition increases the payoffs for everyone, a non-zero-sum game. By this I mean that like a play, a political economy is made up of persons who, through their very differences and conflicts, make up an artistic whole that is greater than the sum of its parts. A good play has a meaning that gives value to all the characters in it. Its larger significance is a kind of profit that accru accrues to all of its members. No playwright saw better than Shakespeare the inner economy of a play, the way that value is created collectively, and the deep analogy to the economics of a human community. All the world's a stage. By now, many other cultures and languages have absorbed those rich and peculiar notions of trade, reciprocity, the deal, and so on, that Shakespeare helped to embed in the Anglo-Saxon imagination, and the practices of democratic politics that arise out of them. Shakespeare's economic language has survived the huge challenges of socialism, communism, fascism, and the other statisms that arose in reaction against its vision of things. Shakespeare's core insight is that human created value is not essentially different from natural value. For Shakespeare, the market is a garden. The value that is added by manufacture and the reflection of that value in profit and interest are but continuations of nature's own process of growth and development. In uh, Winter's Tale, for instance, uh, um, uh, Perdita and Polixenes are talking about um, the, uh, uh, the very profitable, at that time, very profitable art of hybridizing flowers and hybridizing um, fruit and you know, plants in general. And uh, um, Perdita, who is very much a sort of nature girl, says um, uh, she doesn't want to keep the, uh, she doesn't want to grow gillivores and, uh, and carnations because they are, um, uh, they're, 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 there is an art, she says, that in the, uh, uh, what is it, in the making, that it's not great, great creating nature. There's an art in their composition. And Polixenes replies, uh, well, say there be, so suppose there is. He says, uh, yet nature is made better by no mean, but nature makes that mean. So over that art you say adds to nature is an art that nature makes. We couldn't make, uh, we couldn't breed flowers unless we, um, uh, we were given by nature the capacity to breed flowers. We couldn't make uh, you know, anything artificial that we make is in a sense natural. Um, in this, um, Shakespeare is sort of disagreeing with Aristotle, who sharply distinguished the natural from the artificial. And this sort of this uh, argument goes into all kinds of things, like, for instance, Dante's 
ethics of, um, of usury and of homosexuality. The creative processes that produce a wild flower, a domesticated animal like a dog or a horse, a yeasty loaf of bread, which you're using um, uh, uh, you know, yeast as a kind of domesticated beast, a violin, a house, a clock, and a poem, are not, in Shakespeare's opinion, fundamentally different. They are all nature nature giving birth to new and more valuable forms of existence by recombining old ones. And if it's natural for value to increase, then it is also natural for the symbolic store of that value, money, to increase by compound interest. In this, Shakespeare was defying the traditional doctrines of all three of the major religions of his world, that making money breed was wrong, that it was unnatural. Shakespeare proposes a kind of gardening economics a technique of growing value rather than, for instance, extracting and exploiting existing stores of it embodied in raw materials such as topsoil, ores, and fossil fuels, or in the youthful strength of the laborer. For Shakespeare, economic exchange is the embodiment of human moral relations. He doesn't make it the embodiment of human moral relations. He doesn't make a strict distinction between personal rights and property rights. For him, personal love cannot be divided from the bonds of property and service that embody it. I love you according to my bond, says Cordelia to her father, King Lear. His rage at her for this plain truth is the beginning of a tragedy and a totalitarian political revolution. In As You Like It, Shakespeare defines marriage as a blessed bond of board and bed, in which three B words blessed, the emotional and spiritual element, bored, the material and economic element, and bed, the sexual and reproductive element, are likewise combined in a fourth B word, the bond of, natural con of the natural contract. The intangible elements of the contract, love, spiritual communion, friendship, can be cashed, or in Shakespeare's suggestive word, redeemed in material word, in material terms. For Shakespeare, value must be embodied to exist, just as the inscription denoting the denomination of a coin is embodied in the intrinsic value of the metal of which it is made. Of course, there are problems with that if you have counterfeiters and if you have uh, um, uh, people who clip coins and, and so on. But uh, uh, Shakespeare loves that, 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 that image. The Shakespearean theatre then was a kind of marketplace, and that market was one of the preconditions for the emergence of democratic politics. But what happened to this view of things in which market price is an in indispensable part of our value system? Well, in the Renaissance, writers began to be accorded cultural prestige as celebrities. They wanted to be seen as aristocrats, whose system is not commerce, with the ancient technique of giving to the poor, making them, de de them dependents, and recruiting them as serfs, retainers, or liegemen rather than employees. Writers started to take on the affectation of a contempt for money. Take Johnson's The Alchemist. It is all about funny money versus honest gentlemanliness. The market as fakery or prostitution. Remember, unlike Shakespeare, Johnson published his plays as if they were Latin classics, like the ones in his patron's library. Writers were beginning to try to become respectable, and thus encountering a disjunction between the means of their livelihood, profitable publication in some form or another, and the aristocratic company they wanted to keep. Johnson, though, is an honest artist, and knows at bottom that as an illusionist, he's not so different from face, his, his fake alchemist, and subtle, his con man. Milton is in some ways a sturdy supporter of the free market, and his great attack on censorship, Areopagitica, is in many ways a defense of the free market of things as well as of ideas. His republicanism included a den denunciation of monarchy itself, and Charles I, whom Milton hounded to the executioner's block, had, uh, you know, he voted to, to have his head chopped off. 
had aroused the ire of the parliamentarians, partly by the use of government economic monopolies to raise money to pay off the debts of the government. Uh, in other words, arbitrary in interference with the market. This is one of the great uh, grievances of the, of the parliament parliamentarians, of the, of the roundheads. And this, again, this relationship, this uneasy relationship between government and, and, and market um, is uh, particularly um, difficult for writers. Uh, writers could sometimes, if they were very talented in other ways, uh, the law courts and the civil service could give them employment. But um, uh, I Chaucer, for instance, had been the equivalent of the government trade minister, and uh, Milton would serve as a member of parliament. And this meant that they were relatively free from the discipline of the market. But both are vitriolic about the marketizing of religion. So one factor in the ambivalence of the writing classes about markets and money was the writer's search for a living in the church. Given the virtual absence of copyright law, a writer could not defend himself from piracy and make a living from his writings. Not wanting, as Shakespeare laments to his aristocratic friend, not wanting to go to and fro and make himself a motley to the view, uh, perhaps he could, like a university professor today, use his writings to attain tenure in an institution of learning. In those days, basically the church. John Donne was an imp impoverished scribe until he found favor with the church authorities and became a dean. Later, the search for a nice fat church benefice or living became the subject of countless novels by Jane Austen, Anthony Trollope, and others. There's an obvious and deep ambivalence. Now, truly saintly types like George Herbert accepted the humble conditions of obligation in religious life, you might say, the relationship between the lig in obligation and the lig in religion. Um, uh, one of my favorite George Herbert poems is, is Redemption, and here it is. Having been tenant long to a rich lord, not thriving, I resolved to be bold and make a suit unto him to afford a new small rented lease and cancel the old. In heaven, at his manor, I him sought. They told me there that he had lately gone about some land which he had dearly bought long since on earth to take possession of. I straight returned, and knowing his great birth, sought him accordingly in great resorts, in cities, theatres, gardens, parks, and courts. At length, I heard a ragged noise and mirth of thieves and murderers, there I hear him espied, who straight your suit is granted, said, and died. Here Herbert is using the language of property in commercial law to describe the astonishing gift of, of salvation. But the rift between literature and the market widened. Dryden and Pope are quite vitriolic about the publishing industry. Um, you know, think of Mac Fleckno and, and the Dunciad and so on. Um, these wonderful lines by Dryden in, uh, in, in Mac Fleckno, uh, all about the, uh, the, the publishing industry of the day. No Persian carpets spread the imperial way, but scattered limbs of mangled poets lay. From dusty shops neglected authors come, martyrs of pies and relics of the bum. Much Haywood, Shirley, Ogilby there lay, but loads of Shadwell almost chokes the way. And it's even funnier because he doesn't use the whole word Shadwell. He just uses the first two letters as if he was trying to disguise the name. But of course, loads of sh nearly chokes the way. Um, well, but it's with the Romantics that the true literary assault on market capitalism begins. Here I must criticize many of my dearest literary friends, especially Blake and Wordsworth. Here's Blake. I wander through each chartered street, near where the chartered Thames does flow, and mark in every face I meet, 
marks of weakness, marks of woe, in every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every band, the mind forged manacles I hear, how the chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls, and the hapless soldiers sigh, runs in blood down palace walls, but most through midnight streets I hear, how the youthful harlots curse, Blasts the newborn infant's tear and blights with plagues the marriage curse. My God, it's wonderful stuff. But he, he and suddenly Blake is attacking the institutions of the state and the legalization of human relations as much as he's bemoaning the marketing of sex and the extremes of wealth and poverty in the great city. But even Marx recognized that country life in England's green and pleasant land was a state of rural idiocy and the industrial wage slave was probably better off than the rural vagrant. Wordsworth famously despises the filth and corruption of commercial London and was an ardent supporter of the French Revolution. Getting and spending, he confesses, has laid waste his own powers. So again, you see this ambivalence. Here we must acknowledge the importance of Immanuel Kant as we move on through this, this brief uh, eventful history. Kantian morality opposes both uh, Aristotelian gentlemanly virtue and merchantly honesty and casts doubt on the Shakespearean synthesis. He despises England as a nation of chop uh, shopkeepers. Maxim and duty define the good rather than modest mutual benefit in contracts and exchanges because the latter involve personal interest and cannot pass Kant's test for ethical impartiality and liberation from the deterministic chains of natural motivation. To be a human being, he thinks, he feels, is to be free. Nature, as shown by Newton and Laplace, is a deterministic machine. To act freely and enter the realm of moral value, one must have separated oneself from one's material nature. In other words, from whatever pleasure or pain one might obtain from action. There is a new kind of philosophical high-mindedness. Morality is explicitly defined as not what happens in a market. As the novel emerges as an art form and copyright begins to be observed, the tension between literary high-mindedness and profitable book sales increases. Samuel Richardson's Pamela is basically about, uh, of course, the sale of virginity, and secondly, about the, uh, the, the sale of writing. Uh, it's Pamela's literary production in her letters that eventually frees her from the threat of sexual bondage and ruin and gains her the riches of Mr. B's estate. And you get something of the same kind of thing going on with Daniel Defoe's Moll Ma Flanders, who is a whore, but a successful one. She's managed to transform the sex for sale transaction into a memoirs for sale one. On the level of the fiction, what is bought is moral redemption, and on the level of Defoe's authorial position, it's Moll's fictional sins in exchange for Defoe's literary profit. In Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, Crusoe uses all the accumulated technology and psychological discipline of European market progress to make himself comfortable and make a slave of, of man Friday. Defoe here anticipates Smith's, uh, uh, um, Smith's Wealth of Nations, 1776, a date you may recall, where Smith points out that um, European market methods can multiply the value of work a hundredfold. Now, unlike some less thoughtful authors, Jane Austen seems to be the soul of good sense, rather like Shakespeare. In Pride and Prejudice, for instance, um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the people that, the people whose association seems to be harming Elizabeth are, um, are the gardeners, and the gardeners' significant name, the gardeners are... Um, uh, 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 are, are in trade. Um, they're, 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 uh, they, then turn, they then turn out essentially to be the essential link or connection that enables Elizabeth to, uh, to get Darcy. Um, uh, 
And as Elizabeth says, you know, uh, to be mistress of Pemberley might be something. Uh, that, that she's, this is not a kind of romantic thing, sort of, let us cast the world to the winds, you know, our love will, uh, you know, and, and, and so on. She is, of course, she's not going to marry for money, but on the other hand, to be mistress of Pemberley would be something. There's the prospect of a world in which markets, morality, and literature can coexist. But in France, of course, the ambivalence continues and erupts into the French Revolution with a huge increase in the power of the state and the delusory prospect that maybe the state can replace or at least dominate the market. Honoré de Balzac, both a royalist and an embryonic socialist, uh, he is quoted later on by Marx and Engels. Victor Hugo calls himself a socialist but believes in free enterprise in the market and distrusts government employment. We may have seen the most, the more, this recent, the recent movie, uh, Les Mis, with its revolutionary ending, which in fact rather distorts his message. After all, Valjean is himself a successful capitalist who has provided employment for hundreds. Charles Dickens, of course, is the is something of a hero for the anti-capital for the anti-capitalists, but they misinterpret him. Dickens is actually a good friend to productive business, but believes strongly, as we see in A Christmas Carol, in spending and keeping up the velocity of money. He's not against trade and the money economy, but is very much in favor of generosity, charity, and the gift economy. Why should the gift economy coexist with a, a, a money market economy? Bleak House can be read as an indictment of British industrial capitalism, but it can also be read as an attack upon the, the chancery court system with all of its government sanctioned corruption and rent seeking. He's certainly not the socialist or even the Fabian that some have made, made, made of him. His sympathy for the working class, epitomized by the character of Joe Gargery, Gargery in Great Expectations, is balanced by his sympathy for the wretched convict Magwitch, who has made his fortune by business enterprise. Anthony Trollope is generally not unfavorable to the marketplace, although he clearly regards it as an arena uh, for meaningful action inferior to the world of inherited landed wealth. But in the way, way we live now, he delivers a searing denunciation of London business dealings, sadly casting a Jewish banker as the villain of the piece. George Eliot in Middlemarch celebrates Dorothea's liberation from inherited poverty and the constraints upon women that such non-market forms of ownership imply. But unlike Eliot herself, who became independent by selling her books, Dorothea becomes the helpmate of a proto-Fabian socialist politician, Ladislaw, who is trying to use government to liber liberate people. Still, Eliot is not a foe of the market as such. Mrs. Gaskell and Beatrix Potter, who also became financially independent by selling their writings, are similarly down to earth. It's interesting that the women writers who had experienced their escape uh, from conventional sexual roles in the liberation of selling their writings into the market are much less inclined than the men to despise it and go on about the evils of capitalism, at least at that time. Hardy, Thomas Hardy, bemoans the, the destruction of, tragic, uh, of traditional rural mores by the new industrial wealth, though he clearly sees the flaws in the old morality. There are no easy answers for Hardy. His is a tragic vision. D. H. Lawrence says, In my father's generation, with the old wild England behind them and the lack of education, the man was not beaten down. But in my generation, the boys I went to school with, colliers now, have all been beaten down, what with the din-din-dinning of board schools, books, cinemas, clergymen, a whole national and human consciousness hammering on the fact of material prosperity above all things. The industrial problem arises from the base forcing of all human energy into a competition of mere acquisition. With the advent of modernism, we get the perfect storm of literary hostility to the market. To the old motives of quasi-aristocratic scorn for trade, romantic nostalgia for bu bucolic simplicity, and Kantian high-mindedness 
are now added Marxism with its ideological critique of capital and existentialism, which in Sartre and sometimes in Camus demonize the abstraction, inauthenticity, and bondage of market morality. In America, novelists like Theodore Dreiser, John Dos Passos, uh, Upton Sinclair, Richard Wright, Ralph Ellison, John Steinberg showed various versions of this tempest. The poets either ignored or ridiculed the market, with the exception of Ezra Pound. Ezra had true greatness and insight on this. At least he realized the profound importance of what, in Marx's insight, is a central fact of the human condition, the irreducible connection and tension between price and value, the blessed bond of board and bed. He got it terribly wrong, of course. Uh, that is, I think, probably both Marx and Pound, but I'm talking about Pound here. Pound's gold standard economics, his enthusiasm for the ideas of Lenin, and his statist Confucian morality led him directly into the embrace of Mussolini and even a certain uh, secondary complicity in the murder of the Jews. Uh, to quote him, uh, he's one, I, I wish I could quote it all, but I don't have time, but you know the great passage on Uzura. Uh, with Uzura hath no man a house of good stone, each block cut smooth and well-fitting, that design might cover their face. With Uzura hath no man a painted paradise on his church wall, harpes et loose, or where virgin receiveth message and halo projects from incision. With Uzura seeth no man Gonzaga, his heirs and his concubines, no picture is made to endure nor to live with. And so on. With Uzura, wool comes not to market. Sheep bringeth forth, bringeth no gain with Uzura. Uzura is a murrain. Uzura blunteth the needle in the maid's hand and stoppeth the spinner's cunning. Pietro Lombardo came not by Uzura. Duccio came not by Uzura. And he goes on and on and on. Contra natura, me thunders. They have bought whores for Eleosis. Corpses are set to banquet at behest of Uzura. Well, a grand rant, but you know, perhaps Pound didn't realize that uh, uh, Goethe, Jan von Wolfgang von Goethe, had already refuted his arguments in the second part of his Faust. Goethe's brilliant argument for paper money is finally an argument for both economic progress and human flourishing, but few actually read and few, fewer understood the point Goethe was making and writers went on trying to enforce a transcendence of the market that can only come, as Blake reminds us, through the palace of excess. Writers, accustomed to having sentences come out as they wish, hate the economic strings attached to art. They continue to try to push strings when the way to use them is to pull. And we see the same thing going on with American uh, Vietnam era poets, uh, Ginsberg, Gary Snyder, Robert Bly, the evil American military industrial complex who was trying to turn this beautiful Asian country into another blighted market economy. Of course, the irony is that the victorious Vietnam was liberated from a regime that supported traditional family and agrarian virtues and is now a bustling capitalist country. Eco-feminists like Doris Lessing and Joanna Russ continued uh, to attack the market. And I think we can see, uh, although I don't really have time, time to talk about him, David Mitchell's brilliantly written Cloud Atlas is another assault on the system that has, we have to uh, admit, doubled world life expectancy, provided education to half the planet, liberated women and minorities, and created democracies now outnumbering the traditional tyrannies across the globe. Black writers were ambivalent. Traditionally freed slaves like Phyllis Wheatley, Frederick Douglass, and Harriet Jacobs just wanted a fair shot at the marketplace. Capitalism was the great liberator. The capitalist North defeated the agrarian South. But the civil rights movement became entwined with socialist ideology. Ultimately, in some ways, I think, very strange bedfellows. Uh, but there were countercurrents. There's Buckminster Fuller with his do-it-yourself technological economics. Libertarian, free-market, anti-state control science fiction writers like Robert Heinlein, Eric Frank Russell, Paul Anderson, and many others continued the optimistic free-market dreams of H.G. Wells and Jules Verne. There's Ayn Rand, of course. 
I can remember the seeds of boomer, laid-back, technological capitalism in the whole Earth catalog, giving birth eventually to Apple and Google. There are many exceptions, of course. I mean, think of, for instance, Thomas Mann with his sober acceptance of middle-class industriousness and inventiveness, and his vision of spiritual adventures that can still await his bourgeois Hans Castor, or Walt Whitman and Carl Sandburg with their exuberant celebration of American industrial progress and social transformation, or Vladimir Nabokov with his rapturous and only half-ironic peer to American bourgeois pop culture. Today there are poets uh, like uh, Dana Joya, for instance, um, who welcome a marketplace that liber liberates us and renders us less the peons of the state. I, I think that there is emerging now a new basis for a sort of unified, if tensed, theory of value genesis or value creation in the arts. The word value can rightly carry over from numerical value to market value, to political value, to truth value, to moral value, to aesthetic value, as long as we can distinguish the increase of reflexivity, feedback, and reflection as we ascend the scale. We see emergent orders with specific sets of rules, but unlimited powers of generation in many kinds of systems. Evolutionary ecologies, with their emerging ecological niches and new species. Markets with their infinitely subtle interplay of price, value, need, and desire. The scientific community's self-criticizing system of truth discovery. Common law with juries, adversarial pr procedure, and judicial review. And the US constitutional system of checks and balances. Each of these is what chaos and complexity theorists call a doubt-driven dynamical system that explores new informational spaces and generates novel, spontaneous forms of self-organization. In these autonomous systems, with their characteristic K-order, as somebody called it, and non-linear causality, indirect deterministic cause, and sorry, direct deterministic cause is no longer a coherent concept. And freedom, that Kant rightly saw as essential to both morality and art, finds a natural home. The market need no longer be seen as the evil other for the serious writer. Values are generated by the new emergent games of feedback and reciprocity, just as the value of the $500 bill in the, in the game of Monopoly is generated by the game itself, and as the meaning of a poem is generated by the arrangement and choice of words and the creative constraints of meter and rhyme. Using this emerging understanding of complex feedback systems, literature may now begin once more to tackle the huge issues of human value that occupied Shakespeare, Dante, and Goethe. Any work of true art is such a system. Let us write writers recognize, as did Thoreau in his essay on economy, the kinship of our own practice to that of traders and merchants, to know both the value and the price. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Um, we can take questions, but uh, before we do that, maybe I can put one sure. opening question to you. Um, the overall topic of the talk is how literature looks at the marketplace. Yes. Uh, how does the market that literature addresses influence the way literature looks at the marketplace. A contemporary writer like David Mitchell mm. is writing for a fairly select potential mm. readership. Mm. Uh, and then there are many writers um, with whom I'm personally less familiar, mm. Stephen King, mm. a whole mm. bunch of people, mm. uh, who are writing for mass audiences. Yes. I wonder if you'd have anything to say about whether that's a, an interesting line of distinction in, in analyzing both past and present, uh, the way in which literature looks at the marketplace? Well, I would say probably David Mitchell, I mean, who's a really good writer, I mean, uh, but I would say that he's probably read, uh, you know, far more in places like um, Ann Arbor and uh, um, Madison, Wisconsin, and 
uh, New Haven and, uh, and Austin, then he would be read uh, you know, across the country that um, uh, he's, you know, his depiction of the future as gradually um, descending into a kind of industrial uh, uh, dystopia and uh, <coughs> eventually collapse and uh, ecological collapse and savagery and so on. Um, uh, you know, it's somewhat in the tradition of Doris Lessing, I think, and maybe Joanna Russ in some ways. Um, uh, it, it, it's something like, you know, why do we like stories about um, a, a, about sort of catastrophes, about uh, uh, you know, we, there was a whole fashion for a while of sort of, of you know people surviving after the Great Atomic War. We, it's almost as if uh, it, 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 it's a wish fulfillment it, it, that uh, we we sort of we resented the bustling, vulgar success of all the people that weren't being writers and, uh, and being, you know, aesthetically sensitive and so on. And so we, uh, you know, we imagine, we like to imagine worlds in which that whole, that whole sort of disgusting market system uh, uh, collapses in, in chaos. So I, I think there's, uh, there's, something, there's something of that feeling about it. Now, rather interestingly, you could say that the Hunger Games is a sort of is a sort of counter. It's a sort of reply to that sort of that sort of literature, uh, to that sort of uh, literature, that sort of uh, those sorts of movies. Um, the the uh, uh, Road uh, Warrior series is also very interesting in that respect. You know, you you you, you know, with the, the third of the series, uh, Beyond Thunder. You know, Road Warrior Beyond Thunder has got this kind of proto-capitalist society that is then uh, kind of uh, rejected by the sort of more Edenic, noble, savage sort of children's society with the help of, uh, of, um, of Mal. Um, yeah, any, any, uh, any, uh, any, uh, any, any other questions? Would you like to follow? Would you like, did, I, did I get your question, Steve? Uh, yes, um, and, and sort of taking it into film, I think, mm -hmm. was probably the, the appropriate move mm -hmm. uh, from there on in. Um, most of the writers you discussed of the 19th century mm -hmm. were writing mm -hmm. for broad readerships, at least yeah. in terms of yeah. broad readership yeah. would have been yeah. defined then. I think there's a good deal of work compartmentalization yes. in terms of the writers you're discussing who are yeah. more, more recent, yeah. um, and, and that's kind of an interesting way of looking at it. Um, Carl, I uh, wanted to talk a little about the changes recently in the, I guess the last 50 years in patent or copyright law. Yeah, and very contrast good. that with with the movement for open access and uh, how how uh, artists and writers are responding to both of those uh, those currents. That's a wonderful question. Um, you know, I, th I think there really are truly tragic conflicts in the world, and one of them is, you know, between the, uh, the, the you know intellectual property uh, and, um, and 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 the the, uh, the the huge value of free interchange of uh, of knowledge and information. And, um, I I don't think there's really there's no solution. I think there's only always a compromise. Are there people writing perceptively about that in an artistic way? That's a very interesting question. Um, I mean, the thing is, uh, you know, I'm a writer. I'm a poet, and you know, the the university is basically my patron. So I'm you know, really part of a, of a very ancient sort of patronage system. Now, um, one solution to the problem might be something in that direction, where uh, maybe there's something like what 
uh, you know, the role that bishops and aristocrats used to play in supporting artists and writers and intellectuals. Kings would bring philosophers to their courts and so on. We don't have, in a sense, the university is playing that role. But of course, that also takes people out of the, the, the realm of market discipline. So, uh, you know, another piece of, uh, and then of course you have things like JSTOR, where there's an attempt to kind of, again, to, to uh, have a restricted, sort of guild-like um, system. Um, and then that contrasted with what some people would view as the martyrdom of uh, parents' rights, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. yeah, exactly, exactly, okay. exactly. And you know, hunting down uh, uh, what's his name, the guy that uh, released the uh, uh, damn it, memory's going. Uh, I need a junior moment here. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, you know, who was the guy who escaped? You know, he, uh, he's in the Ecuadorian. Oh, right, right. <laughs> uh, um, I can't remember his name. But I, I Somebody know. knows him. The WikiLeaks. We're WikiLeaks. Yeah, right, right. The right. right. Yeah, as, as Julian Assange, yeah, yeah, right. So, um, uh, actually, the idea that this might itself be turned from being a condition for writing into being a subject is very interesting. I mean, maybe I'll go off and write a novel about it, but, you know, uh, the, 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 uh, because it, it's a... It's a genuine problem. I mean, in a way, it's something that is going to finally hit all these huge companies like Google and so on. That, uh, how are you going to, you know, at a certain point, you know, they're piggybacking on the, uh, on, uh, on the uh, advertising industry, but uh, um, sooner or later, it, that's not going to be enough. I mean, how do you marketize that? Uh, um, Maybe it will just carry on feeding upon itself, you know, like the housing market did for so long. <laughs> but you know, um, I don't know. I don't know. It's a wonderful question. Yes. Uh, I'll apologize in advance for the inartful way in which I will be asking this question. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me that uh, there is a dearth in literature that recognizes that the marketplace is the engine by which wealth is created. Yeah. <clears throat> Certainly, the 19th century and early 20th century literature reflected upon the difficulties that people had as the Industrial Revolution unwound and people saw themselves as being ground up in the machine. Mm. And yet somehow, the marketplace, it seems to be, has created wealth. I, I think oh, yeah. Apple and Google are, are examples of wealth mm -hmm. having been created by the marketplace. Mm -hmm. uh, huge you, amounts of, of, of real wealth. I mean, the, you know, the fact that we, all, we, we, we go around with, uh, you know, the equivalent of 30 or 40 libraries of Congress in our pockets. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <it's, laughs> you know, what, you know, what greater gift of wealth could there be, really? Um, but, but somehow it seems that the literature is not recognizing that as being a good function of the marketplace. Yeah. It somehow gets morphed into some sort of greedy oppression, yeah. which I don't think is really the case. Well, there's a lot of greedy oppression, perfectly right. But then there's also this other, this other side. I mean, maybe you've got a little bit of it in the... Um, the Facebook movie, uh, um, God, my memory is good. What? Social network. Social network, yeah. Um, uh, the, there was some sense of, of the excitement and, um, and maybe Moneyball was another example um, uh, of um, movies that, that actually celebrate kind of intelligent market dealings. Uh, on, or again, you could say, uh, well, you know, Schindler's List is a very interesting movie. Schindler's List is, is, is about um, 
uh, you know, really, uh, you know, Schindler's, you know, nasty market motivation uh, being the only defense we have against the, the monstrous idealism of, uh, of Nazism. You know? uh, it's a beautifully counterintuitive. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's only counterintuitive because of, of our Kantian viewpoint on things, but uh, I, you know, I, I do have a kind of philosophical program of eventually of trying to sort of refute Kant's uh, ethics. I think Kant, Kant has done some terrible damage. And you know, I think I think uh, Himmler's speech to the uh, um, uh, you know to the SS, uh, in which he says, you know, that I know what what you what you have to do is. The, the, you know, sort of disgusts your honest, natural human feelings, but you know we have to rise above that. We have to. You know, that's a Kantian argument. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. The Book of Eli is one of those uh, post-apocalyptic movies mm. uh, that I think sort of really fits uh, the sort of line of thinking we were talking about on that on that one side of you know what are you left with after this collapse mm -hmm. and trying to get back to the beginnings I and mean, in Genesis, right? Mm -hmm. And then trying to move forward, forward from that. So you, yes. you, know, you use the word uh, Edenic state. Yes. And, yes. Um, yes. That seems to be exactly the movie that sort of fits the whole, that whole paradigm. Yeah, um, very it's, much. It's very interesting. Because obviously it goes back to um, an oral culture where uh, material world has been destroyed in some way, and even the Bible that he's carrying around is going to be destroyed, so he's got to memorize it, he's got to internalize it, yes. and take it to a, you know, an earlier state of being. A more authentic state of being. Yeah. And you get the same thing, I think, in Waterworld, and also the Postman, you know, the, 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 the David, David Brin's movie, mm -hmm. uh, you know, where, again, there's this kind of, uh, uh, well, let's let's overthrow Babylon and set up, um, you know, uh, set up the, the holy city you know, that, that, that is not, uh, that, that has banished the worser angels of our nature. And uh, the, the thing that annoys people about the market is that it's something that produces a great deal of good out of the worst possible motives that people have. Uh, and I suppose you could say science does too. All these scientists trying to disprove each other and trying to 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 uh, you know uh, uh, attack each other's experimental protocols and so on, and the result is the actual increase of knowledge. You have all these business people trying to sort of uh, ruin each other, and uh, or all these you know ordinary consumers who are trying to uh, you know trying 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 to chisel, uh, trying to drive a hard bargain, you know, and the result is. You know, material progress, material wealth. So another post-apocalyptic novel that comes to mind in the movie, I haven't seen the movie, but uh, The Road Car McCarthy is The Road. You know, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, a yeah. novelist these days. Um, and there, there doesn't seem to be much, I mean, like, there's not much good economic outlook in any way. I mean, it's only with the exchange between father and son just trying to survive there doesn't seem to be any sort of exchange with the world works at that point for him. It seems yeah. but, but it seems to be more brutally honest. Oh yeah, <laughs> but it, but it does it does become the arena for 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 human virtue and value and right. goodness that is and heroic goodness yeah. and sacrificial goodness. And again, you know, you've got the sort of Kantian par paradigm of doing the thing simply because it's the right thing to do rather than sort of the Aristotelian paradigm, which is this eudaimonia in which you, you, you've so fashioned yourself that the right thing to do is exactly the most delightful thing for you to do. And, well, I'll move on to a different vein. You were in mm. movies uh, and uh, novels, and then back to poetry, um, which is my field as well. Yeah. Um, the one poet that you didn't mention uh, among all these uh, poets, I think, that had very directly to do very essentially to do with your talk it was Hart Crane. Oh, yes. And, you know, I think about his sort of very complex vision and having, you know, 
being a son of a, of a, of a what would you call them, you know, a, a candy maker, a, a guy who runs a factory, mm. uh, and a capitalist uh, who um, is not going to inherit the the, the business yeah. because he won't, he's not willing to do the things it takes to yeah. be a good capitalist, yeah. and um, and of course he goes into advertising as well, and but and. But he rebels against these things, but yet he writes a poem like The Bridge, which yeah. celebrates American sort of um, oh, yeah. Yeah, industrialism. Right. Uh, he seems to be a really conflicted character that I would, you know, I'd be interested in what your thoughts are about him, his, his work. I think um, that's a great, uh, I mean, your analysis is, is very nice. I, 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 um, you know, sometimes good literature comes precisely out of a state of ambivalence. Uh, that, 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 in a sense, the iridescent scar tissue that forms upon the surface of the wound is the poem itself. I mean, um, another right, another poet that I could have mentioned was what would be Wallace Stevens. I mean, you know, Stevens was an insurance man. And, uh, um, uh, his poems, although they don't directly, unless you could call the Emperor of Ice Cream a kind of pro communist <laughs> poem, but, uh, uh, but you know, they don't directly ad ad address that. But he's not unfriendly to it. He, he, he doesn't feel that sort of commerce and that sort of thing stand in the way of a more authentic and uh, you know, more uh, you know, spiritual existence. Um, but Crane, I, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll go back and look at Crane with your question in mind. I mean, there's people know him for the bridge mostly. Yeah. I prefer the more lyric poems of, of, of white buildings. Yeah. Um, of course, they, there's a great you know, one of the big books written about the bridge is called Splendid Failure. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's, um, I, I think it's probably true. It, it, the poem seems to me not to ultimately cohere into something, and I think perhaps it is his own conflicted um, life that. He wants to celebrate these things, but yeah. in his own life, he was never able to make that. Yeah. So why should he be able to make it play out in the literature itself? It seems to be ultimately perhaps too romantic. Would be, and maybe that's part of the suicide line. You know. I uh, really that's very, very interesting. interesting. Are you writing a book on it? <laughs> no. no well, I, please I, do. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that, now it occurs to me, of course, William Carlos Williams, uh, Addison. You know, where you know. He's not willing to go along entirely. He's not willing to go along with the kind of Whitman program of, you know, look at all these, you know, look at this wonderful bustle of, of right. American creativity and so on. He seems to be kind of a healthier balance of that, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Celebrating Patterson as, as, as the town, as the body, as the yeah. river, yeah. As, as the economy, yeah. um, but also being, I think, very realistic in that it's. All very difficult as well. Yeah. You know, and the thing I love from Patterson actually is um, one of the great abstractions in um, 20th century American poetry is you know um, no ideas but in things. Yeah. You know it's um, it's you know it's an idea. Yeah, exactly. It's, 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 right. You know, and he repeats it again and again in that poem. Sure. Um, I, I, he's a very complex poet in that way. Oh yeah, no things but in ideas. You know. What sort of way? If you take the information theory kind of uh, description of the universe, and right. then that's actually making sense. Any any other any other questions? Or, uh, yes. Uh, uh, I, I'm getting the sense I think that um, the the trend of, of modern literature is the only return to morality comes. Post apocalypse, there is no return to morality before the apocalypse. Is that a correct perception? Well, how can I put it? I think that you know people are usually usually have more common sense than that. But you know when you're when you're writing literature, you're allowed, as it were, to 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 enact your uh, your your you know, you know Freud. Freud's theory of dreams, you're allowed to do some wish fulfillment. And you know, they're, they're, you could also say that it's a kind of, it's a convenient fiction for getting over your ideas, like the convenient fiction, let's say, of the, 
of the of natural man, the noble savage, and the social contract. And of course, there never was a natural man, and, and you know we you know we were gregarious beings, sort of grooming ourselves and 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 having political conflicts way back in our uh, primate and and you know simian history. You know? <laughs> um, uh, there never was a, a, a noble, never was a natural savage, and never. You know, and there never was a social contract, but it's a useful fiction. And maybe the fiction of the apocalypse is is a useful fiction for playing in a, in a way with some of the uh, some of those ideas, but the other way around. Instead of thinking about the you know our step over from the state of nature to the state of culture, going the other way, a well, possible step over from the state of culture into a state back into a state of nature. But of course, you could say that you know Gilgamesh, uh, with Enkidu um, being brought into, uh, uh, he's seduced by the temple prostitute into being, you know, a, a member of the culture and a, a hero of the city, uh, has done it all already. You know, and that was six thousand years ago. So you know, <laughs> there's nothing new under the sun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead. People who are writing usually have something to say. And uh, my general thought has been, they're usually trying to say something that they think is important to say that has to do with their evaluation of the way things are. Yeah. Or uh, if, it's, if they said the way, they, they, the way they think things are, mm -hmm. they also want to say the way things ought to be. Yeah. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not hearing anyone saying that the marketplace ought to be a place where we can see a moral dimension of life working out in daily practice. Yep, I think so. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm really, I really would welcome counterexamples, but um, uh, it's hard to think of, of serious art that, that, that does that. That actually celebrates the incredible sort of uh, opportunity that, that technological market progress provides, and it may be simply that you know we take that for granted, and that it's not a big story anymore. <coughs> that that we've heard that story already. I don't know, but it seems to me that so good writers should be able to give new life to it. We sort of emphasize the competition and the conflict of free market. And but you mentioned the other aspect of it is the win-win. Mm. Uh, every transaction, yeah. everybody comes out ahead. Yeah. Because yeah. otherwise the transaction wouldn't have occurred. Right. Right. And so that's right. where wealth is actually created. Yeah. And we, we emphasize yeah. that much less. Now it, it, your what your remark actually in a sense, pro provides some implicit answers to the to the question. Maybe it's something like this: that um, win lose is much more dramatic in some ways than win win. You know, I mean, if the you know if the if the the the, the uh, if the Japanese used to have a tradition in which baseball games were supposed to end in a draw, because you know. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and you know, uh, contemporary high school, uh, contemporary primary schools tend to like uh, tend to like to have non non competitive games. It may be that that, that 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 we want to have radical conflicts in stories, um, and uh, and that therefore the idea of win win is is not dramatic enough. One could also say maybe something like this: that the whole difference that. Uh, that this gentleman, yeah, so what's your name? Uh, Mallory Miller is my name, sir. What? Mallory Miller. That Mr. Name. Miller is talking about, uh, it, 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 you know, between what is and what ought to be, again, that is in fact the driving force for any plot. I mean, the moment you have a, a plot or a narrative, if everything is just fine, then there's no story. Yeah. There has to be a situation where the way things are are not the way they ought to be. The way things are is the young lovers are pining for each other, but they're being separated by, 
you know, money or parents or class or something like that. And, you know, uh, and so one wants to, one's reading, you know, are they going to make it, you know, is he going to be able to convey the message to her, you know, is, uh, you know, is she, you know, is she going to decide not to commit suicide because of how terrible this is? You've got a plot, you've got a plot line. Um, so there has to be a difference between what is and what ought, ought to be. And uh, in a way, if, if the, market, the marketplace is too much a situation where what is, is what ought to be, then the market is not going to be an interesting thing to write about. But again, it seems to me that you know, a good writer should be able to somehow finesse that and make it work. There yeah. is a kind of odd counterexample, and it's odd because it doesn't take a very positive view of the market. Yeah. But what it does, I think, is explore uh, in a very penetrating, uh, colorful, and often amusing way um, how markets fail or fail to arise, mm. the kind of conditions of mm. market failure. Um, and that's Conrad's Nostromo. Oh, very set in this uh, absolutely classic failed state yeah. um, in which capitalism is trying to penetrate yeah. and its hero is seduced by greed yes. and yet what you see are all the things about this failed society, this kind of little kind of Latin American republic yeah. uh, that prevents productivity, right. that prevents ordinary people from right. prospering. Right. Uh, it's a beautiful, yeah. maybe despite the yeah. sentiment of the yeah. author, the, 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 general world view yeah. of the author, uh, a kind of beautiful diagnosis of Well, that. I don't think it is against the, the world view of the author. In fact, Conrad is a good example, I think, of somebody who is not pasta. I mean, most of, you know, Conrad's, uh, the, the character that he, that he often uses as his mouthpiece is Marlowe. And Marlowe is pretty, is, is always a merchant seaman, you know. He, he, uh, uh, he's somebody who's part of this great British trading system around the world, um, and uh, uh, that there the, 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 the seems to be a kind of positive valuation for the kind, the kind of integrity that, that, that comes out of that. I mean, Marlowe is not an aristocrat. He's not a, a you know, he's not a Brahmin. Um, he, he's, um, <coughs> uh, you know, he's, he's a, 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 a an insightful technician of the market. He sees a kind of heroism in that kind yeah, of thing. And, and the character of the mind manager yeah, yeah. Uh, sort of embodies that in Nostromo. But yeah. at the same time, the system right. is predatory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting stuff. Right. But it seems to me to be something that is, it's a fertile subject. The reason I did this huge sort of gigantic sort of overflight of, of all of this it, it, it was really not so much to to make a point as to to suggest interesting directions that we might go in thinking about literature among other things in, in, you know, in, in, in the humanities in ways of thinking about humanities. Bruce, when is when is uh, Professor Turner speaking tomorrow? Remind the audience. Right, four p.m. Uh, in room one hundred and six. Of this, this building. Of this building mm -hmm. upstairs. And that would be about epics and... About epic, yeah. I've just uh, was, uh, finished a book in which I collected uh, 60 uh, or more epics from all over the world. And, um, and it's, it's significant that they come from all over the world. That is, epic is not some kind of Euro Eurocentric sort of uh, imperialistic uh, sort of... Thing, uh, 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 you know, every almost every major human culture that has got something that, that is the equivalent of a city has come up with an epic, or at least an epic cycle that, if left to itself, would be condensed by some genius into an epic. Mm -hmm. And the astonishing thing about epics is that the, about the epic is it seems to be a natural genre, and human beings have reinvented it many, many times in different parts of the world, and very often they, it has the same subjects, the same stories, the same basic <coughs> themes, and so on. And my argument to, uh, to, as a spoiler is to say, well, uh, what is epic? Epic is the human way of 
describing how we got to be human. In other words, it's the story of human evolution, told from the inside and done in narrative form. That might, it might have been opposite for me to say, by way of introduction, that uh, Frederick Turner is the author of two epic poems. Uh, one, uh, Epics for Our Time, about the terraforming of Mars. Um, and, uh, and, the, and the other is kind of post-apocalyptic. In, in, in well, in, in, but there the never was an apocalypse. The apocalypse is simply that you know we ran out of fossil fuels and and uh, and uh, metals and everything, and so we've gone back to a kind of uh, feudal sort of society. Uh, and you know the, the the story is about a group of uh, of uh, uh, of independent republics in the in the valley of uh, in the Ohio Valley that is. Uh, uh, un suffering an invasion by a group of uh, fundamentalist sort of uh, counties in the Appalachians. So as much as our institute would have liked to have had Homer here as our speaker, <laughs> we've done almost as well. Uh, in, 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 Thank you very much.